Good morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, I want to invite you to turn with me back to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to kind of land the plane on our dawn series, the series of the dawning of Jesus' ministry. We already read in chapter 4 how uh, the people that living in the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Jesus Christ is the light. We're going to be reading just three short verses today, 23, 24, and 25. So uh, go ahead and stand with me if you have that. If not, you can read along off the screens with us this morning. This is Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 23. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill and those suffering with various diseases and pains and demoniacs and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and Jerusalem, and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who brings real healing into our lives. Lord, we pray that for our hearts this morning. Lord, we ask that your name, Jesus, would be uplifted, continue to be uplifted and glorified in our service today. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, that we would not be just part of the crowd, enamored with the things that you can do, but people who follow you. And we ask for this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Ministry. What is it? Ministry. What should a church be doing? I think if we just did a poll of uh, churches in America, what is ministry? We would come up with so many answers to that question that it would be hard to bring about any coherent results from that. What is ministry? What counts as ministry? What are the component parts to ministry? What is it in ministry that if nothing else gets done, this has to get done? Our passage today gives us an x-ray, if you will, of Jesus' ministry. It lets us see beyond uh, some of just the, uh, the, 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 sup- the, the structure to see the superstructure, the underneath, the, uh, literally the skeleton, the bones of his ministry. What was his ministry about? What was the focus of his ministry? Because Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, but in everything, He is our example that we are to follow. In America, I mentioned just a little while ago, 21st century today, uh, we are very pragmatic in the way that we we look at things. Whatever works, that's ministry. What's ever going to get people here, that's, that's ministry. Well, maybe, maybe not. In fact, as we shared a few weeks ago, the metrics so often associated with churches today are are the three B's, right? We're we're familiar, at least in Oklahoma, with the three B's. That's Bud and and Barry and Bob, our our, our, our coaches, you know? And so, but the three B's of churches are buildings and bucks and bodies, right? So if you got buildings and bucks and bodies, you got people showing up and you got money coming in and you got lots of buildings, you're a success and you're doing successful ministry, well... Maybe, yeah, maybe, but maybe not. Jesus, in this passage, we see the priorities of his ministry. We see the power of his ministry and the focus of his ministry. And we see the people of his ministry. We're going to take a look at those today. 
Look back at this passage with me. Far from being just a, a couple of throwaway verses. When we look at this, no often, I mean, even I, looking at this, when I started off, I was like, oh, what am I going to preach there? It's almost kind of that feeling. But when we dig into this a little, we get our hands in the dirt, and we spend time with Scripture, we begin to see so much more than when we just glance over Scripture. Take a look with me at the verse 23. We're going to see the priorities of Jesus' ministry. There are three of them, and they're very easy to see. See, Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee. Galilee is an, an area, uh, even in today, in, in Israel, a very north part of, of, of Israel, up by the Sea of Galilee. It's roughly 60 miles wide and 30 miles uh, uh, high. And so roughly, it's somewhat similar to maybe the Oklahoma City area. And so it is a, it is a you know, it's a large area. He was going throughout this entire area. There was possibly three million people, according to what the historian of that day said in that area. There were a lot of people in that area, and he spent his time going throughout Galilee doing three things, teaching and proclaiming the gospel and healing people. Teaching and proclaiming and healing. What are the priorities of ministry? Well, here are the priorities of Jesus' ministry. Teaching proclaiming, healing, teaching. What is that? The word that's actually used there is the exact same word that's used in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, teaching. As one pastor said, Teaching is the thorough explanation of truth. It is, it is going through and, and spending time with people, laying out point by point the truth of Scripture. Going over this again and again, rehashing this, learning this more and more and more and more. Jesus did this, he said, in their synagogues. That would be his first stop. He would start there and begin in their synagogues. Synagogues were the, uh, basically the center of Jewish society at that time. And so it was the uh, center of their religious society, their cultural society. It was part of who they were. Most Jews uh, did not because of, uh, they were spread out all over uh, both uh, Asia and Europe would, did not have time where they could actually come all the way back to Jerusalem. So they had these synagogues, which were local gatherings of Jewish people, and they would spend time one day a week in worship where they would sing and they would read a passage and they would have that passage explained. And if there were guests, other uh, Jewish men that came, uh, they were often invited to read a passage of Scripture and teach from the scripture. It was where the teaching and training of the young boys took place. It was where people oftentimes could uh, just interact with one another and spend time with one another. This was the central focus of Jewish society. This is where Jesus started off. And in fact, if you take a look in the New Testament, that was exactly Paul's plan as well. Begin teaching, sharing the gospel through teaching, but it didn't stop there. He went on to proclaim the gospel. When there needs to be teaching, teaching of all of Scripture, but there has to be in ministry a proclamation of the gospel. Jesus was going about preaching. The word there, there is actually the Greek word caruso, and it means to, to preach or to proclaim, to herald, to share out loud the good news. I think this is, we've shared this before in here, there comes a place where, yes, our lives must reflect the truth of what God has said. We need our actions to line up with our words. But there comes a point when we do have to share out loud who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. We cannot simply leave that undone, I'll let my life be my witness. As we shared before, I have never been out mowing my lawn out front and, and just mowing my lawn and my neighbor walks up, man, I just saw you mowing the lawn and I just knew from you mowing the lawn that well that you knew Jesus. Can you tell me how to be saved? That's never happened. It's never happened. Now, they might very well appreciate the fact that we keep our lawn mowed and that's a good thing. And yes, you should mow your lawn and take care of, you know, your, your house. But, but, but those things... Those things don't replace sharing 
the good news about what God has done. Notice what he was preaching. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We understand this side of the cross, what is that? It's the good news of Jesus Christ. What God has done for us in Jesus Christ. The message before that, in fact, we just go up a few verses, verse 17 in this chapter is this. Here's his message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's rule and reign over his people interacting with them being with his people it is here it is at hand and it showed up with Jesus Christ we understand that is a call to call people to repent and trust in Christ to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and healing Jesus went about healing as well. Now, we're going to talk about that third aspect uh, in, in just a moment. We're going to talk about that as we discuss Jesus' power. But I want to really focus on these first two, teaching and proclaiming. Jesus didn't do everything. And in fact, this is the beginning of his ministry. When we take a look at Matthew 9, 35, we hear this exact same thing in the middle of Jesus' ministry. John 9, 35 says this, Jesus was going throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. That sounds really familiar. Yeah, what Jesus continued doing throughout his ministry is exactly what he started doing when he began his ministry. What was Jesus' ministry, it was to share the gospel with people, teach people God's word, teach them about God. Now we have to ask, why? Pastor, that, that kind of sounds boring, teaching and proclaiming, so people just kind of get to sit and listen all the time, and somebody gets to stand up and talk. That sounds boring. Well, Jesus taught in a lot of different ways, preached in a lot of different situations. He wasn't boring. First of all, I want to say that. But secondly, there is something very important we need to see from this. Romans 3 tells us there's no one righteous, not no one, not even one. If you've been in church, you know that verse. We've shared that around here. We often use that in sharing the gospel with people. It's important. There's nobody righteous, not even one of us. Nobody can stand before God and say, yeah, I've done this and this and this, God, and you should let me in because I've done these things for you. And nobody can do that. But the verses right after that, the phrases, excuse me, right after that, in those same verses say this, there's no one who understands. No one who seeks after God. I want to focus on that first one. No one understands. For some reason, maybe you're like this too. I sure am. There are times I really think I know what's up. Anybody else there with me? You just, I, I kind of know what's going on. I don't know everything, but I kind of know what's going on. And, and then I, I talk with people and I talk with my wife. And my wife is like, man, you have no clue what's going on, do you? <laughs> okay, you're right, I don't. You don't. I, I don't know. I, apparently, I don't know. I didn't know all of this. I didn't know that. I didn't know this. And so we think a lot more highly of ourselves sometimes than we ought to. We think that we really do understand God and we really do know. You can pull anybody out across the street, uh, anybody that's walking around right now, anybody else that you're going to meet later today, and, and you, if they'd be willing to talk with you about what they believe about God. There, there's a lot of opinions about God, but, but the Word of God tells us nobody understands Nobody understands who God is. Nobody understands what life is really about. Nobody understands everything about God. Nobody understands God apart from Christ. How do we understand? How do we get there? We don't get there by inner reflection. We don't get there simply by spending time with ourselves and as, as some Eastern religions like to say, you know, just kind of emptying ourselves of, uh, of all conscious thought and we get to some sort of higher plane of existence. And so, No, 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 no. We understand and know by listening to God's word. This is why teaching is so incredibly important. Because we don't know. We don't know what God's like. What we're told by Paul, we knew he, he wants us to, God wants us to live in ways that are pleasing to him. Well, what's pleasing to him? We don't know. 
I mean, we think we do. We've got our own ideas. Oh, well, this will and this will and that will. But God's Word tells us if what we believe about God is not informed by God's Word, you are not believing in the God of Scripture. So this is, this, is, this is hard and this is harsh for us, but we've got to recognize this. A lot of people like to use the excuse, well, I like to think of God this way. I like to think of God that I don't like to think of God as a God of wrath. Well, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter the way you like to think about God. People can come up to me and say, Matt, I like to think of you with hair. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's not me. God is who he said he is. And the only things we know about God that we truly, correctly know about God come from his word. We're reminded in Romans 1 that we can recognize that there's a God out there. We can see part of his eternal attributes by the things that are created. We can look up into the sky and recognize there's a God out there. But that doesn't tell us what that God is like, what he desires for from us, what he doesn't desire from us, the ways he wants us to walk, that he's holy, that he is good, that he is kind, that he has sent his son to die for us. Where do we find those things? We find those things in Scripture, and this is why we must be taught, because we don't know. You ever been playing a game that everybody else seemed to understand the game except you. Maybe it was a sport game, maybe it was a, uh, just a game around the table, maybe it was last week as you were spending time with family. And so, hey, come in, this game is so easy, and everybody else is playing the game, and, and you're sitting there going, I have no idea what's going on. None of us enjoy that. None of us enjoy watching a sport that we're like, I have no clue what's going on in hockey. What that blue line there for? You know, understanding the sports that you don't watch and you don't understand what's going on. Why was that a foul? And it makes no sense unless we understand. Life does not make sense when we do not understand it by means of God's word. God has told us who he is. God has told us what life is about. We must be taught these things and this comes from God's word the reason teaching is so important proclamation proclamation of the gospel why must we proclaim the gospel because well there's a number of reasons first of all the vast majority of people outside of our church today maybe they're still in bed believe one thing that we're doing here they're dressing up in all their fine clothes and pretending to be people that are a whole lot nicer than they really are. Pretending they've got their lives together a whole lot more than they really do. Or they're, here's do this good thing, do that good thing, and God will like you. That's the most common sentiment that we hear. We're learning how to be more judgmental. No, no. We are here to share what God has done for us and who God is because he has made himself known in his word. God the Son came here to die on the cross as we learned even last week, we hear every single week, for our sins. We don't celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ once a year. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ every single Sunday. That's why the day of worship moved to Sunday. We proclaim the good news that God in Christ, God the Son, came here, died on the cross for your sin and mine because we are all sinners. There is no one righteous. Every single one of us has sinned against God and every single one of us is under the judgment of death because of that. Not just physical death, but a death where we are eternally separated from God in a literal place called hell. And God, in his love for sinners, sent Christ to redeem them. People don't know this news. People in America do not know this news. We also need to share this good news because 
we as believers have a tendency to forget it. I don't know about you, I forget things sometimes. And sometimes it's very easy for me to get busy doing this, doing that, taking care of things at home, taking care of the kids, getting ready for sermons, studying, and I forget, okay, wait a second, the reason that I'm right with God is because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Sometimes the weight of my own sin, maybe you're there today, continues to hang over us. We have a real enemy who loves to bring that up before us and go, look at you, look what you did here. And, and he'll be right, you, you did that. How can you call yourself a Christian? Look at what you did. Boy, if people only really knew the real you, how in the world could you be a Christian? And we proclaim the gospel to remind ourselves of the truth. We are sinners. And Jesus Christ is the Savior for sinners. Martin Luther tells the story. He often felt very attacked, almost as though he could see the devil personally just leveling these attacks on him again and again and again and again. Look what you did here. Look what you did there. Look what you did there. Had a very guilty conscience, was very introspective, recognized attitudes and, and thoughts and different things going on inside that he was like, all of these things are true. I'm doing all of these things. I am sinning against God in all these ways. And I hate these things. I don't want them, but I still struggle with them, seeking to put them to death. And he was reminded again, and this is one of the reasons why he says that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves daily, and if necessary, hourly. Because we need to be reminded the reason we are right with God is not ourselves, but Christ. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done. That our sin, even the sin we trip up and fall into now, Christ has paid for. And we can come to Him with our sin and ask for His forgiveness. Receive His forgiveness. Receive His healing, His cleansing from that sin. He can. We, as believers, need to hear the gospel. We must hear the gospel. It's the good news. But we also need to hear the gospel for a third reason. Because for many of us, we think the gospel is simply, and that's an important word there, simply the door we walk through. Jesus himself said, I'm the door. He who comes through, uh, those who come through me has life. You can go in and out and find, find life, find pasture. He said, I'm the door. And people think, oh, well, that's all it is. I walked through, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've done that. So now I'm, I, I'm done with the gospel. I, I can lay that down and, and kind of move on with my life. No, 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 no. The gospel not only is the door, the way we come into a right relationship with God, it is also the means by which he holds us now. It is also that which empowers our obedience and our ability to obey, our ability to be changed. The gospel, when we recognize I'm not who I should be, I should be following the Lord more here, I should have this attitude that Jesus talks about here, but I don't have that. God's grace, His mercy forgives us for that sin. And in his grace, he can empower us to obey all by means of what Christ has accomplished for us through the gospel. The gospel is everything for the Christian. It is not simply the door. And we need to learn how the gospel relates to every single facet of our lives that it will bear fruit in all of those places. He went about teaching and proclaiming our ministries as a church. It can take many, many forms and do many, many different things. But if their focus is not teaching what God has said, and if a desire in that ministry is not for the proclamation of the word so people can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it is off target. It is off target. Our ministries should teach. They should proclaim the gospel. If we do not, who will? 
want you to notice as well with me the second point. Not just Jesus' priorities in ministry, the power of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus was healing every kind of disease and sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill and those suffering with various diseases and pains and demoniacs and epileptics and paralytics, and he, he healed them. It's very easy for us to look at these words and, and resonate with some of these things because we either know people or or have people in our family, or, or, or maybe that's you this morning. You face some of these things. Biblically speaking, sickness is a result of the fall. Adam and Eve chose to sin against God, ate of the fruit that God told them not to, and the rest of us are dealing with the ramifications of that. We are all under the sentence of death. We are all sinners by birth and by choice. Sickness came in through sin. And so this means that sickness today, sometimes sickness is the result of poor choices. Sometimes sickness comes about because of sin. We need to say that. Sometimes that happens. 1 Corinthians tells us that. In fact, in the passage talking about the Lord's Supper, he said, look, some of you, uh, some of you have fallen asleep. Some of you are sick. Why? Because you have sinned against the body in doing these things, in taking the Lord's Supper wrongly. And what was that wrongness in taking the Lord's Supper? They didn't remember one another. They didn't wait for one another. They didn't love one another. Sometimes sickness is just the result of being in a fallen world. We don't know why. There is no rhyme or reason that we can see. And sometimes Jesus himself reminds us our sickness is for his glory. Jesus himself said, his disciples came up to him, hey, this man, he was born blind, so tell us, Jesus, was it this man that sinned, or was it his parents that caused God to make him be born blind? Because they had one reason that they could understand that people, that would happen to somebody, and that somebody must have messed up. And Jesus said, hey, it's neither of those things, but that the glory of God might be seen in him. We don't always understand. What we do understand is that Jesus can heal. Take a look at these things. It says he healed there in verse 23. Every kind of disease, every kind of sickness. Uh, the word disease there means something that's really, really serious. A really serious condition. Jesus could heal those things. The word sickness there means something less so. It's kind of the cold. It's kind of the yuck, the crud that's going around. Something like that. And so not as serious. But he could heal those too. Those who are ill, he could heal. Those with various diseases and pain, some of you are very familiar with that. You know, you deal with constant pain. Jesus can heal those type of things. He did heal those type of things. He could heal those that were demon-possessed. He could heal those with epilepsy. He could heal those who were paralyzed. And Very often we look at this passage and go, okay, well, pastor, why aren't those things happening today? And I would say, hey, a greater miracle is actually happening today. a greater miracle than just these type of things happen today. The real thing that these were pointing to was not simple physical healing. You ever have one of those aha moments, but it's aha in a way like, oh, that's not good news. You're like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I had one of those this week as I was reading through these, this passage. We don't know a lot about these people. We know that they were from all around Syria. That's basically the area in all around where uh, modern day Israel, and so not just the nation of Syria. People all around Galilee, people all around Judea. We found people that are following from these different areas. We don't know a lot about what happened to them afterwards, but we do know one thing. Every single one of them still died. It's a morbid thought, but it absolutely is true. Jesus can heal from these things, but all people will still die. This, again, is a result of the fall. What these healings were pointing to was not mere physical healing, because there was going to come a day then that their bodies would fail. They would wear out. 
these actions were pointing to the kingdom that was coming, the type of healing that he was going to bring in his kingdom, was was pointing to the type of healing that he brings spiritually to us. Because our greatest problem is not the physical difficulties that we face. Our greatest problem is our sin. And just like Jesus could heal every kind of sickness, it's careful not to say Jesus healed everyone. We know that that's not true. Acts 3, Peter and John healed a guy at the temple gate. He had been there for a long time, the text tells us. Well, apparently Jesus had been there as well. Jesus healed those who came to him at this time of ministry. Those who came to him, he, he healed them. And he healed every kind of sickness. Those who come to him, Jesus heals. What that means is this. For us today, it doesn't matter what kind of sin you're facing, what kind of difficulty you're facing, Jesus can heal you and forgive you for that. What is that greater miracle that can go on? What is that greater miracle that takes place today? The new birth. That we cannot make ourselves alive. That we have been separated from God by our sin. But Jesus Christ can give life. And notice the whole point of this. We can come to Jesus and be healed. This is the point. This is what they want us to see. Matthew wants us to see here. Those who come to Christ, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I'm not going to cast them out. He will take care of them. He will heal them from their sin. He will forgive them for their sin. And he will lead you out of your sin. And he will give you a life with him forever. Because these bodies... These bodies are going to wear out. We need something that's going to last longer than that. We need a promise that's going to endure beyond just this life. And that's what Christ gives to us. That's the type of healing Christ can bring. Let me tell you why that's good news. Because for many of you, whether you're a believer or not, there are things that you have struggled with in your life. I have tried to lay that down, Pastor, and it's just not possible. I've tried to stop. I've made promises again and again. Maybe at Falls Creek. Maybe at some sort of men's retreat, like if you went to the men's retreat this weekend. Uh, maybe it was something, and I promised, God, I, I just, I promise, I'm laying that down. I'm never picking that up again, and I'm good for like a week, Pastor. And then that attitude is back. Those snarky comments are back. That evil action is back. I can't do it. You're right. This is why you need a Savior. This is why you need someone to save you from your sin. Because those actions, the result of those actions, you are guilty before God. You need someone to cleanse you of that guilt, who took your guilt to the cross for you, who bore your guilt upon the cross, and someone who can lead you out. Jesus is able to do that. Folks, we are dependent upon what is absolutely, completely supernatural here, week in and week out, without fail. We depend upon Christ to do what we cannot do. He's the one who can heal. What that means for you, believer, it means that when you see these things in you, Maybe they're the big ticket sins that lots of people know about. Maybe they're things that nobody know but you and, you and Jesus. Maybe they're inside things. Maybe they're attitudes. Maybe they're, they're just the way that you think about people. Maybe it's the way your eyes linger over things. Maybe it's the way that you treat and act toward people. Maybe not verbally, but inside you know you're like, hmm, 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 when you see them. So you have those attitudes, those sinful actions we can run to him with those. Jesus, I have this. This is wrong. That's in there. I'm doing this now. I don't want to. Will you lead me out of this? And he has the power to lead us out. He has the power 
to change our lives by His gospel, to conform us more to the image of His Son, to bring to life those who are dead, not just those who are sick, but those who have no spiritual life, and to make them alive. Real quickly, notice the last point, and we'll close with this. Notice the people of Jesus' ministry. Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, beyond the Jordan, all of these traditional areas of, uh, of, of, of Israel. Uh, it says Syria before that. Maybe some people from outside Jerusalem. We, we don't know. What we do know is they were people from all over. This is the second year of Jesus' ministry. It's when his public ministry really began to take off. He was in the, the year of... Uh, the, very few people knew him, calling his disciples together, doing some things. It's the uh, year that we read about in John 1 through 6. But you begin to get to, into this year, and he is immensely popular. And we sometimes think, man, if we could just do things like Jesus, we'd just blowing the doors off this place. Everything would be great. We need to recognize that the third year of Jesus came, the third year of Jesus' ministry, that year when he was no longer the cool guy no longer the popular ministry. When Jesus was feeding people, when Jesus was healing people, everybody loved that. And when he began teaching the truth of God's word, people were like, oh, hold on. Hold on. It said large crowds followed him. Jesus loves people and is willing to heal people. Whoever comes to him, he does not cast out. But hear me, he didn't come simply to form a crowd. He came to make disciples. In John 6, we hear about Jesus trying to share with people what he came to do. Literally thousands of people are there. And he tells them up front, I'm the bread of life. I'm the water of life. Follow me, you're not going to be hungry. Follow me, you're not going to be thirsty. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, pointing ahead to what he was going to do on the cross, pointing ahead to the Lord's Supper. They didn't get it, and they walked off. Jesus, heartbroken. He had just fed these same people, just a day earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. We should be willing to minister to whoever comes through our doors. Jesus' will was willing to minister to whoever came to him. But we should always remember that Jesus' focus was to make disciples, to call them not to simply be part of a crowd, but to follow him. Not to simply be part of a group that's like, oh, yay, this is cool because Jesus heals us and Jesus gives us food and Jesus does all sorts of cool things for us. But when he begins to make calls on our own life, begin to wander away. The crowd comes to Jesus for what they can get. Heal my life. Fix my problems. Heal my marriage. Fix my business issues. <coughs> The disciples follow Christ. They come to him for everything. Came my water real quick. Sorry, I apologize. Follow Christ. Not just for what he can give you. He can heal our eternity. He can forgive us for our sin. And we need to remember that. And trust him for that. But follow him for him. <coughs> because he's worthy. If we follow simply for what we will get from him. Because he will fix the problems that I go through. When he doesn't fix those, we wander off. He's worthy. He's worth it. Whether our lives here right now get better or not. Are you part of the crowd? Are you part of the disciples? Are you following Jesus? Or are you just happy with what he can give you? My prayer for you today is that 
Jesus would heal our hearts and lead us as a church more and more to follow him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for your word.